Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. My name is Erika De Benedetti, and uh, I will manage this webinar. Before to get started, I would like to give you a couple of information. Firstly, this webinar is recorded, and uh, the recording will be available on biostimulant.com website and on our social media in the next days. Secondly, I invite you to use the Q&A box that you can find at the bottom of, of your screen to submit uh, questions. We will collect your questions and answer to at least some of them at the end of the presentation. The topic of today is uh, precision farming benefits and potential application in the biostimulant sector. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Davide Camarano, professor in environmental crop science at Harus University. Welcome, Professor, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to present here to this webinar today. I'm going to share my screen and start my presentation. So as has been introduced today, I will uh, talk about precision agriculture, precision farming or precision agriculture and the potential benefit uh, for the biostimulant sector. Um, I hope with this presentation I can stimulate further research in the future. Maybe some of the things I'm going to show could be a bit more far-fetched for the way the research is nowadays still in its infancy in some of the aspects. But think about this. When I started working in precision agriculture 20, more than 20 years ago, uh, thinking that I could go into the field with the mobile phone and use the GPS or so use the camera to do things, it was unthinkable, and yet we can do it nowadays. So I hope this uh, will help you to clarify certain things about precision agriculture. I give you some example, and then some, some kind of perspective on that. The talk today will be divided in several sections. I have a kind of an overall in introduction. Then I will go a bit more on something that digital versus precision agriculture. I guess most of you heard today the word digital agriculture, agriculture 4.0, but also precision agriculture. So I would like before going further to clarify certain things, to help you make some clarification in there. And then I will show you some example about monitoring the spatial and temporal variability, such specific management of agronomic factor. And then I can delve into more details about this precision ag and biostimulant sector. And I'll draw some conclusion. So to begin with, one of the main challenges that nowadays we are on a trajectory of a trend in population growth, uh, growth in urbanization, in city industrialization, which kind of subtract areas to agricultural land and sometimes good agricultural land. The conflict as we are witnessing, unfortunately, today's pandemics and the projected changes in climate pattern, as you can see, you know, depending on the currently the, the latest IPCC report, paint a picture that it depends how you want to interpret the result, but definitely we need to act to keep the global temperature below a certain threshold. But this has implication because it's implication in agriculture. All this means that we need to produce food on the same or less cultivated land on a, without causing any environmental damage, so decreasing the environmental footprint, but keeping the farm profitable. And so as an overall sector, the one of uh, the agriculture and the agricultural research has a main role to finding solution to those complex uh, problems facing agricultural production. Just to put things a bit in perspective, this is a figure showing you the evolution of uh, the amount of, uh, of, um, of people that a farmer needs to feed. So in 1960, one farmer needed to feed 26 people. In 2017, 155 people. And in 250, it is projected that they would need to feed 265 people. In a, so they would be needed to be fed in a crowded world and in a changing climate. What would the projection tell us in 2050, we will live in a world that is different than what we are experiencing nowadays in terms of climate. And usually wherever there are, there are big challenges, innovation flourish a lot. All the innovation comes because of the big challenge. 
But if we think about innovation and agriculture, unfortunately, agriculture is lagging quite behind respect to other sectors in innovation. And it's because of a lot of reason. And that also is causing that uh, we need agricultural experts to new set of skill. And this is just to put things in perspective for the rest of the talk, for example, uh, agricultural experts, they need to have a, a strong agricultural background, but at the same time, need to have this system-based thinking approach, uh, need to know a bit of analytics and need to understand other uh, scientific area or work in multidisciplinary team where they can get this information. As I said, I need to clarify a bit of terminology for you because you hear a lot digital ag, agriculture 4.0, precision agriculture. Often these terms are kind of used inter interchangeably, but they are not especially precision and digital agriculture, they are not the same thing. So in general, digital agriculture combines new technology, data analytics, and tend to translate information into solution. It is made of several interrelated components. I'm not going too much into the details, not the scope of this uh, talk, but just to say, if we want to give a definition and it's not exist yet, a, a common definition for digital agriculture. It is a discipline that combines multiple data sources with advanced crop and environmental analysis to provide support for on-farm decision-making. On the other end, after more than 20 years, precision agriculture is finally having an official definition. I won't read it through the whole definition, but I want to highlight a few points. When we talk about precision agriculture, we talk about management strategy, spatial temporal variability for an agricultural production. And so if I bring them together again now, they're not the same thing. A farmer using digital agriculture combines the latest technologies in order to increase the value of several areas of the farm. So we're not talking about the field here. We can talk about the storage. We can talk about the uh, commercialization, we can talk about other aspects, not necessarily the production within the field. Precision agriculture was defined in 1992 when Candle start becoming more structured as a research, as applying the right input in the right place at the right time. So precision agriculture deals with the management of the field variability. And therefore, we can consider it a sort of component of digital agriculture. Before moving on, I want to give a few additional points on this because it's going to be so invasive and you, even funding wise, I think even for the best stimulant sector is good to have this bigger picture of digital agriculture. Why is that? Because it's a market that when fully implemented has been projected that it might lift crop yield and create a big market, which has lots of opportunity. So it could be a next uh, game changer in, in agricultural production. And not only for raw crops or for crops growing in the field, but I believe in also in uh, control condition as well, where already some of this technology probably have found more um, area of development and application respect uh, raw crops. And in fact, uh, digital agriculture has a lot of growth investment and expectation. I just put some of the um, information here, but you can see newspaper covering it, uh, public and private funders putting lots of money in startups, in research and so on. And the last point I want to make, it's sort of a warning sign because precision digital agriculture comes with a lot of data analytics. You will generate lots of data that need to be analyzed. You have lots of things which there are um, new analytics that are applied to kind of make sense of the data. But this can cause a problem. Usually when a new technology comes into play and like in this case, for example, digital agriculture, it's gonna be a peak of inflated expectation. So nowadays, if you hear a lot of if you read a lot of news, there is a lot of expectation of this agriculture 4.0, digital agriculture, and so on. Sooner or later, we're going to go to this disillusionment kind of 
top of disillusionment, we're going to drop down. And we will find later on a kind of where it really this, the true value and benefit of this technology lies through. Think about machine learning. You're really hearing a lot about machine learning and artificial intelligence and so on. But sometimes they tend to find patterns that don't exist in reality, but only in the, in the data, not in the real world. Now, translate this in agriculture. Imagine all the digital, oh, if you get a lot of agricultural crop, soil, weather data, and your prime machine learning, you can still get results out of it. But sometimes this crop soil, crop physiological data, soil data, the nitrogen dynamics in soil plant system, if you use just a machine learning approach, you may end up finding patterns that don't make any sense. And so the point is, when it comes to apply those technology in agriculture, is to make sure that Agriculture is at the center of the system. A lot of startups have been kind of uh, seeing how they work. They collect the data, images, sensors, and so on. They run their own machine learning, their own artificial intelligence. They get out solution and they say to the farmer, that's it. That's what you need to do. And things don't work because of this reason most of the time. And in fact, the last point I want to make before moving into precision agriculture is that digital technologies will not triple IS the role of human judgment. And when I say human judgment, therefore I think people with the right skill in soil, crop science, and so on, human decision-making is an important factor and digital technology will not replace that. So keep that in mind. And now we move into precision agriculture. So before seeing the precision agriculture and biostimulant world together, I said, let's kind of give you a bit more background in precision agriculture as a non-exhaustive presentation. Precision agriculture, you can see from this field why it was born originally. What do you notice in this picture below? You notice a lot of variability. You notice this is a field that was planted uniformly, but you can see in some place there is quite a, an, uh, the plants were ahead in the emergence. In other places, you probably barely see the green. You see the soil with different color. You see some erosion going on. You can see the neighboring field and you can actually see the same, how much variability there is in the field. That's how it was originally born precision agriculture is because managing this variability in the field. So you see how, what, what can we do to make sure that we can uniformly have a crop in the field rather than this variably. Over the year, this kind of main message has been refined, but the core issues is still that. And in fact, the site-specific management has two components. One component deals with the spatial variability. So as you can see in this picture, again, you have a variability in space. You have a lighter color, darker color, more emergence, less emergence in this part of the field. That has to do with the spatial variability. The other component is the temporal variability. A crop growing into the field will grow following a certain pattern. Imagine this picture here being a crop around flowering, for example, in the whole field. If you go next year into the same field and take another picture, maybe this would be different because the soil, the plant, interact with climate in different way. We'll see that a bit more later. So you have these two components, the spatial component and the temporal component. And the successful management in a specific way depends on how well we can assess this variability, how much we know that comes from spatial variability, how much is the temporal variability. So this degree of changes is fundamental to understand. Then once we understand those, how can we have a proper agronomic management designed for this temporal and spatial variability? And also, importantly, more importantly, is the precision of the machinery. If we don't have machinery, they could apply precise. Uh, although I can say it depends on the, how we apply, but precise application is important for a specific management. To, to sum up um, the steps for adopting precision agriculture, there we have three big steps. Assessing the variability in the field, and before applying variable rate technology, we need, in order to manage the field variability, this is the first step and is important. But in my opinion, there is a third step that is often overlooked or put in a sort of 
less important spotlight, which is the evaluation of site specific practice. A lot of companies that will offer commercial solution for precision agriculture, they only do step one and two, sometimes not even that well, unfortunately, assuming the step three is a consequence every work. And farmer will realize that that's not often true. And we'll have a practical example on that later. But in my opinion, the valuation, given especially within the EU, how the EU is imagining agriculture in the next 50 years, has to be on three levels, the evaluation. Evaluation from an economic point of view, because farmers have to be profitable. From an environmental point of view, because we want to have a profitable farm, but with a less environmental footprint in terms of leaching and in terms of emission. But we also want to have a quality evaluation. If we produce, for example, barley for beer, we need to have malting quality. Tomato for processing, we need to have lycopene quality. So depending on the crop, we also need to have a sort of evaluation that goes for nutritional or quality point of view. In my opinion, this aspect is completely overlooked at the moment. And it is important because it helps to link research in points one and two with the more practical aspect of policymakers, the EU in this case, or uh, farmers in terms of profit. So going back to point one now, we got a bit more in detail. Uh, crop growth, crop development, and crop yield, biomass, and so on, is the results of many dynamic interactions. Think about weather, genotype, soil fertility, uh, agronomic management, pest and disease. They all impact the growth and the development of a crop. But if we think vertically, there is also this very intrinsic relationship between what's happening in the soil, with the plant, with the climate, with the agronomy, so with the management as well. So this soil plant atmosphere interacts in each point in space to define a special variability of a crop. So if you see here this image, for example, there are areas in which the crop grows quite well, areas in which the crop doesn't grow that well. This is because in each point of the field, this relationship is different. It's not uniform across the field. This relationship changes also in time. You can see image one, image two. You can see a completely different story. These two pictures were taken the same growing season at two different times, about a month and a half, two months difference between each other. You can see a lot of variability changing there in time, because in time, this relationship changes as well. So you can see how complex it is. Although a lot of time they tend to have a reductionist approach research in this area to try to simplify this, but I don't think often it works because this intrinsic are very intrinsic this relationship and, and they really impact both aspects. And so understanding the rational and the causes that lead to variability in the field will help to manage the field. Of course, some of the properties will have a high spatial variability and a low temporal variability. Think about texture. If you know that, for example, in this part of soil, you have a heavy clay or a high bulk density or a certain pH level, for example, you will have a variability that might change. Yes, but yeah, within a year, will it change? Not much. Will it change within one year to another? Maybe it won't change. So you will have some kind of variability that has a high spatial component and low temporal component, vice versa with the other, which means if you understand all this as a proxy, of what happened in the field, you, you can adopt certain management practice. Look at this example from Australia, where there is a variable rate liming application for correcting the pH. The researchers, this is a farm, and it's a um, 95 hectare farm, and the researchers used a proximal soil sensor, so, so a sensor that goes above the soil and, and monitor this electric conductivity signal. They defined the field in, into the two classes, a, a red class, which is uh, class one, which is 79 hectare, a green class, which is uh, 16 hectare. Then they did three replicates, so three points, but targeted. So in class one, they sampled three points, one, two, three. In class two, they sampled three points. They looked at the topsoil pH. Then what they say, they say, okay, in class one, which is 79 hectare, we just monitor this year. We don't correct for the moment. In class two, we correct, and we propose to apply 1.3 tons per hectare of lime, the researcher did. 
how practically this is important because if they were going to apply the whole field, they would have spent much more money. In this way, in about 79 hectare, the farmer did not apply any lime. He only applied lime on 16 hectare, saving 78%. So the savings for the farmers start becoming quite significant. On the other hand, fertilization, especially for nitrogen, it's challenging. It's more challenging. It's not that easy to do. Because nitrogen in the soil has two components, a temporal and a spatial. So it has a high variability, especially in time. Think about the leaching of nitrogen, the movement of nitrogen after we put fertilization. A rainfall can change a lot of the pattern of nitrogen leaching and emission and everything. So the, the cycling of nitrogen doesn't, does not have only a spatial component, but there's also a strong temporal component. To complicate the matter for the nitrogen, uh, what happen, whatever happens to the crop growth happens after we apply the nitrogen. Think about that. We plant the nitrogen now in the field, and then for a month it doesn't rain. For a rain fed crop, that has huge implication. For irrigated crops, it's a bit different, but this spatial and temporal component still applies. And just as a generic point of precision agriculture, also involves other agronomic management. Think about uh, pest management, and especially it's relevant in uh, high value agriculture, modern rural agriculture, um, weed management. And just to sum up years and years of research in weed management, just to make it more presentable for this talk, there are three approaches. The AK herbicide can be applied all in areas where weeds are present. The type of calculation and rate can vary according to the soil properties or a combination of both approaches. Now, for weed management, it's a bit different story because machine learning, in this case, for weed recognition is very easy to do. It's just, uh, you know, you can apply my, a machine learning or any artificial intelligence and say this shape, that shape, this shape, that shape, it's shape-based, it's okay. But when we want to apply machine learning to understand the soil, plant, agronomy, and climate relationship for nitrogen management, then it becomes a bit less... Um, relevant they could, and you can and, and a researcher can easily get into the mistake of getting data that doesn't make sense in reality so again it depends your technology for which kind of precision agricultural application you're also doing for precision irrigation is also being used quite um, operationally precision agriculture uh, but of course it depends on the method of irrigation of application so if we are using a drip irrigation it's very hard to do this to, to have site specific water adjustment. And there was a researcher a few years ago who looked to use the uh, precision agriculture technique to plant different soybean uh, maturity group in different parts of the field. And you can see in this example in the field, three varieties were applied in different parts of the on the field, which is an interesting way of site specific application given to the soil condition and soil weather interaction. So the variable rate application uh, varies, depends, uh, vary, vary as according to the type of agronomic input applied. So if we're talking about planting or fertilizer or liquid fertilizer, soil fertilizer, and so on. And they can be uh, applied following two philosophy, map-based approach or sensor-based approach. So imagine you're gonna apply something like a biostimulant, then you could have the choice to do this map-based or sensor-based. The former is used to adjust uh, uh, rates based on maps. Those map, basically, you can, um, you can load them into the tractor. So the position of the tractor in the field must be known and should be related to this prescription map. So basically, if you see this map, for example, comes from many years of yield data. And therefore, this map, it's at the base for the map-based approach. And we will see that later. I will give you an example of that. Application amount, the nice things of this approach is that you can do all the calculation on a desktop. 
you you can also prepare everything in the prior going into the field so there is no danger of mixing any excess product you will know how much you need to put in each zone and so on uh, and the lag between all the data processing so if you need to go to the data to collect some soil or plant sample analyzing the data preparing the prescription map for the map based application can help also to refine the calculation make sure that you can get the right information in, into the algorithms and so on however you need a good uh, gps system because you need to be pretty accurate you need to know that in this zone you need to apply this much in the next zone you need to apply that much so you need to have a good gps that allows you to be very precise on where you are in the field you need to collect sample um, this is more of a practical thing to say because a lot of people nowadays in precision agriculture they're trying to find ways to do every to do this type of mapping without having samples and to me that is wrong because without knowing what's going on in the field and what's going on on plants sensor data could be meaningless if you for example get an ndvi map and you see low value in a part of the field if you don't know why you're having low values there it could be anything, it could be water stress, it could be pest and disease, it could be just water logging, it could be anything, we don't know. So sample is important. So that's why, again, I say it, human input is always important. You could have error, obviously, because of uh, you just sample within the field, you can have wrong estimation of application, um, sampling a point based by application maps are continuous. But there is research on this to help this kind of gap between having points, but then having maps that are continuous. And in, in field in which soil properties change abruptly between zone or between areas of the field, then probably the map based is not really uh, that suitable, unfortunately. So at the core of the map based is identifying those management zone or uniform management zone as I was telling you before. Those are zones, basically, they have similar response within a field. Imagine a yield map coming from a yield monitor. The yield map is telling a, a farmer or a consultant that for the particular year, with the particular management and with the particular soil climate interaction, that was the special yield obtained in the field. No matter the crop, next year, you will have a different map and so on. If you have many years of this data, you can cluster them, and there are many algorithms available to do that, and generate those maps. So for example, this is a uniform management zone map based on six years of farmer's data, farmer's year monitor in the UK. And we can see, for example, here that I, uh, um, I identified a stable zone, which is the blue to yellow color, and an unstable zone, which means over six years, the zone from yellow to blue were stable. So they always produced a given amount of yield, no matter the crop, no matter what weather, soil management. So that crop is telling us every year, no matter if I put the, uh, this crop or the crop, when we harvest, we find this much yield and it's stable across the six years. Another area of the field in which there is a st instability. Some years the crop produce more, some years produce less. Further the defining could be High yield stable, low yield stable. So this zone are always are yielding, this zone are always low yielding. Or the map, the management zone can be done like in, in the pH example we saw before. A source sensor map, class one, class two. That's it depends, but there are again, there are so many approaches. There is a whole branch in precision agriculture that helps with that. The sensor based instead use real-time sensors. For example, this is a picture I took from a field I was working on where we had a soil sensor to generate this type of maps. And we had three classes similar to the pH example there. So they are on the go. They run the sensor and they generate images that we can use to do things, to measure soil properties, crop features, think about weather station, environmental monitoring. Some examples of sensor-based uh, variable rate application are the weed seeker, the green seeker, the other sensors, and liquid chemical applicators, because they can distinguish between green weed and bare ground. That's very interesting application. 
or herbicide detect spread onion weeds, sensors that detect chlorophyll in crops. And this is some example with some, um, some commercial sensors that uh, can be used for the sensor based. So as you can see from the, as you can understand from the uh, name, sensor based is like this sensor is mounted on the tractor, the tractor drives, the sensor senses the difference in growth and then the applicators automatically apply different amount of fertilizer or herbicide and so on. <clears throat> but uh, an example, again, I want to give it to you is that, yeah, you can see practically why it is important to sample. Here, an EM map was done. This EM map showed different uh, variability within the field. And the researchers went to sample down to 70 centimeter and looked the yield high yielding area versus the low yielding area, what was the difference that drives this spatial variability in soil sensing? And you can see how much the soil properties do in this case. Now, if in the future there will be an NDVI map here and we know the idea there will be low level, we know that that is not due because of the low nitrogen, for example, or because of some other things. We know that there are some more, uh, there are some soil properties that are impacting the growth. So if you know what's happening there, you know how to better manage it. Another soil sensor that holds some nice results, promising uh, prospect in precision agriculture is the resistivity of the soil. Uh, look at this picture, for example. I just want to show you this because it's an interesting research in which they had a breeder had different crops. Yeah, these are different genotypes. And these different genotypes had different genotypes with different rooting depth. The researcher took these resistivity maps from planting emergence up to the very end. And you can see at one meter different that this red area, which is the more resistive area, used as a proxy for where the roots are, where the maximum root in depth. And you can see how different genotypes at different growth stages, especially you can see between June and July, uh, where the maximum root in depth lied for the different genotypes. And I think that's a very interesting thing in, in, in row crop management. From some of the source sensors and some of the new data analytics, it's possible to define 3D images of clay content. You can see this is pretty interesting to show where the clay content vary spatially across the field. You can imagine the potential implication of I mean, this information prior uh, any management decision. Thermal sensor and thermal cameras combined with optical camera can provide inform information. Uh, it has been used a lot and is currently being used on water stress resistant genotypes. There is lots of research for breeders to use this both approach to help to understand that the, the, the resistance and the onset, because with this one, we can get earlier than what is visible to the human eyes in terms of uh, temperature increase on plant. And with uh, some data analytics is useful to understand the observed and simulated onset of water stress. They provide information on canopy temperature. And in fact, there are several indicators that can be uh, developed using this canopy temperature approach. Other sensing that could be interesting are the one that define crop height with LIDAR or with, or with cameras, and then using some sort of in the indirect model to define plant height, so you can see a, they took some RGB images, calculated crop coverage, and then because they have the bare soil and the different images, they can see the difference in height anytime they pass with a drone, and they can and they develop the crop height model, and you can see how nice it looks like. So other ways to use sensors is to define crop biomass, uh, fraction of photosynthetic um, active radiation, crop biomass, ET, and so on. I'd like to give you an example now. This is a farm I, work, I was working on and collaborating in the UK. The farm was big, it was about 800 hectares. This is only for six, is 11 hectares. The farmer was using a private company to do such specific fertilizer application based on their zoning. So it was a map-based and sensor-based. It was a combination of the two. But the farmer had his own yield monitor and his own drones. And with his own yield monitor, he was noticing that whatever he was applying, like the farm, the company was saying, he was not getting the right yield production. What I did in this case, I'm not going into the detail, but the point is that if there's seven different approach, once I defined the yield, the, the uniform zone in my way using yield maps, 
Then I did my target sampling at depth. I went much more in depth than the early 30 centimeters sampled in the field. And find that there were sections, especially in the low yielding area where there was a high bark density, a change in texture, and also a change in slope. And those two together determined what we were uh, observing in the field. And because the farmer was producing barley for whiskey production, he was interested in the quality. But also because at the time Scotland was still part of the European Union, we needed to look at environmental implication of the nitrile leaching because they were sitting in the nitrile vulnerable zone areas. And so with data analytics, with climate variability, with the soil plant climate understanding and uh, an economic analysis, we were able to identify the key environmental factor impacting productivity, quality, and leaching. And then be able to tell the farmer how much you need to do in the low, how much maximum you can give in the low yielding zone. But then the maximum could be adjusted from year to year according to the weather up to the moment which application of fertilizer needs to be applied. So as you can see, I basically merged the analytics with the field data, with agronomic knowledge to get to the end sensing, obviously. When it goes to precision agriculture and uh, biostimulant, <clears throat> the variable rate application for biostimulants will de depends a, a lot on the way the product needs to be applied. If it's a foliar product or seed inoculation and so on. But if it's on seed, uh, if you think about what I showed you before, you could have different seed treatments in different parts of the field. Because you know the, there has been research showing potentially we could apply different cultivar in different parts of the field. Then with a similar perspective, we could use the soil sensing and uh, classical soil sampling to understand certain feature of the soil and then optimize that in, in a biostimulant point of view. Thermal images potentially hold more promising application even in the short term. Even now, I think there could be quite a bit of research they could look into on site of stresses in order to target specific biostimulant where it needs and how much it needs. Um, and one thing I want to say here uh, this goes a little bit sidetracked to the biostimulant, but I'm actually starting a new project in which we, I will use this type of robot, which is currently used for also uh, taking out weeds. Uh, some people mounted on this robot cameras and things to actually. Uh, look at the shape of the leaves and then target just weeds in the field. We are using it for a different things because here we are asked to look at the foliar application of nitrogen on different crops. So we do the farming cropping system and we look if this robot, we can really do frequent fertilizer application. Now think about that from a biostimulant point of view. The question I would like to ask and see if I could use this robot in the future. Is a robot like this could be equipped to optimize best stimulants that can be helped for stimulating growth, optimizing, so reducing the use of fertilizer, even if we do fertilizer application or foliar application. So as you can see, there is a lot of new opportunity opening. And here, I just want to say then when it comes to nitrogen, then we need to see what we're talking about. I'm more into thinking about in terms of content because those sensors mounted here, they measure the content in a square meter. In fact, if we talk about sensing for nitrogen content, a few years ago, quite a few years ago, I developed this simple algorithm that worked on wheat prior to the fertilization uh, in Australia and in Italy on two different weeds. And a colleague of mine is trying this in Sardinian pasture and forages. And you can see the same algorithm, which um, didn't mean up to developing on forages, could be used anyhow because it comes from merging crop physiology concept with remote sensing. And now imagine if I could test it here for the nitrogen and therefore if I can optimize nitrogen with this computer and with this approach, maybe in the future our research question could be to see if we could use it for biostimulant as well. An interesting uh, that I found very interesting in my opinion is that uh, soil electric conductivity, so the kind of map I showed you before of the soil that was used for the pH, has also been used in the past to assess the spatial variability of a vesicular mycorrhizal, so VAM, fungi across the field. And 
So you can see the, the uh, researchers got sample and then they looked at the different uh, zone in terms of VC from low to high zone. You can see the color responding from the map to here, they correspond. And you can see that there was a significant difference across the different zone basically. But as the reviewer pointed out, and that's why I spent a bit more time to tell you that, the temporal coverage, they didn't do it. They were only doing a special snapshot and they found that the temporal coverage is important for the special variability because to us, even the results would work only partially. Another example of best stimulants and precision agriculture was on defining uniform management zone within a vineyard in, in central Italy and used to define three management uh, zone showing high, low and medium vigor. They had the four different rate of a four-year by stimulant applied, a standard dose as suggested by the producer, a double dose, half dose of it, and just water. But they didn't find any significant differences uh, and interaction with the management zones, unfortunately. They only find difference in the, in, uh, in the vegetative in, in, across the zone, but not with the different treatments. Um, and this is not new. I, as you, as you understood, I come from this agronomic part of the precision agriculture. A lot of field trial, that classic agronomic trial with replicates, with different treatments, when transposed in, in, in a real farm situation or in a farming situation and looked into a temporal and spatial contest, we found the same. So going imagine now from biostimulant research, going from control condition to small pot condition to trial condition to a field condition, for two, for, for a um, subject that is still in development with a lot of things still need to be understood, imagine how challenging it is. It is already challenging for me to translate agronomic trial into precision agriculture, but it's important to do it. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, actually we should do it because only in, in this way we can foster innovation, understanding where the bottlenecks are, otherwise we will never get to a point in which this can become fully operational or understand why it's operational in certain contexts and not in the other. So to me, the main question here would be why here it didn't work and why here it worked partly. And I can see that there is more interest. For example, I found very interesting this uh, um, high truth phenotyping. It kind of makes up a bit the point I just made it to you. So I can see even the bistimulant community, they are asking the same question. But for some cropping system, there could be issues. In my opinion, one issue is uh, to understand if the cost could be a problem. Uh, so how, what, what I mean about that? I mean, one research question should be, what is the minimum media that is economically to be treated in terms of by stimulant and variable rate application? In the example I showed you about Scotland, uh, zoning it in the way we found economically convenient. So having more, no more than two to three zone was economically convenient for the farmer to then apply such specific application. And a lot of people found sort of the same things. But now for biostimulants, do we need to have a better understanding of a lot of zone, less zone? I mean, there is a lot of questions to answer there that I don't have the answer either. But also depending on the cropping system. I mean, cropping system with subsurface irrigation or drip, or drip line, so drip irrigation, uh, my limit the application of by stimulant on a site specific base. But what you may do if you think about a whole field, for example, where you have these lines, what research could be doing in this case is to understand if it can be applied site specifically but by length. It's an approximation, but better than nothing, maybe, if we can answer both questions together. In terms of future trend, biostimulants can be applied in some specific manner and can help to reduce agronomic input. I really believe that, that we can reduce fertilizer and irrigation, for example, can help to improve soil health. And this is an important thing, but I have to notice how funders, even nowadays, when they fund soil health related um, research, they only fund a few years where we need more longer term for this. And I hope biostimulant could find also an entry point in there. Improve crop tolerance to abiotic stresses and increase crop yield and quality and reduce environmental footprint. In terms of future perspective, there is something that in research is going on and is quite interesting to me is the digital twinning is where you 
this is an example from a control condition. You have a real tomato crop where you can put sensors. You have some, you have a given genotype. You put sensors to measure things, to sense things, and do, for example, light drop phenotyping too. You do a sort of data analytics. You build a, a model, both a virtual model and a more crop-based model to have this genotype by environment by management interactions. Look at the prediction and make some decision and close the loop here. Yeah. And then you have feedback with the breeders, farmers, stakeholders, and so on. And in my opinion, by stimulant management, they can easily find the entry points at, at this level. So that could be something then it's not spoken of in, in this digital thinning world, but there might be a nice entry points for biostimulants as well in this, you know, in, in this loop. Nanosensors. It's a whole complete word. It's, I'll leave you this reference here if you want to read some insight. And they provide useful information regarding the crop status or the crop stress. For example, there is one that was put on maize to detect relative humidity at leaf level. So they was put on different levels, leaves on maize. And for each leaf, there used to be a different curve, as you can see from this picture. Very interesting. And as more we move forward, the more some of the sensors are becoming cheaper and cheaper in the future. And if we have, again, that analytics, chip sensor, digital twinning together, that could be a nice prospect for biostimulants in the future. And so to sum up the whole talk, the area of precision agriculture and biostimulant is still unexplored. I mean, in precision agriculture, uh, we still have a lot to do. And the research in biostimulant, in my opinion, from what I read is in a sort of exponential phase. There is lots that has been discovered and there's lots to discover still. There is still a lot to do there. But because of that, I think it's an opportunity because there are a lot of areas of improvement, lots of opportunity, which unfortunately are not, are not matched by fund yet. So I hope in the future, even research fund could have to foster this integration between the two worlds and move forward. It needs a better understanding of, and, and, uh, of the interactive, fa interactive factors, like I showed you before, you know, the soil, the plant, the climate. How do the soil, how do the soil microbiome impacts? How do the soil microbiome impacts the, the, the nitrogen cycling? We you know, still open in question, even in a given component of this system, let alone when it works together. But I think that's important to start clarifying section and more detailed of this interaction in order to help to scale up from control condition to plot to field. Sensor technology, both proximal, the one much closer to the soil of the plant or remote, so talking about satellite, can allow to help uh, the developing the biostimulant application in a more precise way, taking into account the spatial and temporal variability. And with that, I thank you again for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, please uh, feel free to ask. Thank you. So thank you very much for uh, this uh, insightful presentation. Uh, as you said, now uh, we will have um, a Q&A section. So we still have a few minutes for, uh, yeah. for some questions. And uh, just to remind, if uh, you want to submit questions, please uh, use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We have uh, already received some questions. So yeah, I'm uh, seeing, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I will. Uh, OK, yes, yes. I will start with the first one. So um, about uh, we have a question about uh, how much precision agriculture is used in agricultural management. And I think we can um, also add the, this other one about uh, how much uh, is uh, profitable for uh, farmers, this uh, uh, practice. And um, if uh, you have some information about the impact of uh, precision agriculture on uh, the yield. OK, so first of all, uh, so in terms of profitability for farmers, it depends. Some of the sensors are not very expensive. Some could be very expensive. Some, you know, it depends on the type of sensor they buy. For large, medium, large farms, uh, it could be um, it could be advantageous for applying some, you know, for applying site specifically. I mean, there is a lot of savings. I mean, the sample I showed you in Australia, 
the farmer saved a lot of money and in, uh, that every dollar count, it makes count a lot in the case. So uh, again, it depends on the property you want to test and you want to um, manage, then a, it could be a good investment. But consider that there are a lot of startups and a lot of companies that offer these services. So you don't need to buy the sensors. You can just uh, pay a fee or an annual rent, and then you can uh, actually have those sensors. So people uh, come to you with the machinery equipped for that, and you can look. Yeah, so you don't have, farmers don't need to really do this investment. For example, I remember many years ago in Australia when precision agriculture was still in its infancy, farmers were actually just cooperatively buying sensors and in some area of Australia, but where I went, where I saw a witness was like farmers buying one sensor and sharing it among them. But uh, from 10, 15 years ago to now, costs have gone much down. But again, there are a lot of startups that offer different solutions for doing that. And some of them quite at a reasonable price. So for farmers, that's not a problem. Think that the main problem here, in my opinion, if they can make those sensors give the right answer to make it really profitable, that's Again, if you recall in my talk, the evaluation part, people, I mean, companies and researchers assume, yeah, it's better to do it in this way, but I think farmers have more idea on that, but it's profitable. If it's done properly, I can guarantee that that's really profitable and cheap today. For insect nematode, nematode, I don't think so. There is research, but again, you still need quantifying if that's due to nematode or not. So there isn't much. More for weed than for insect. Uh, there is something for fungal disease trying to be developed, but it's still in our r and I think application commercial, I don't think there is much yet. Um, this was to answer the first two questions. So do you have the other question? Uh, yes, yes, so I, we can go ahead. We have a couple more questions. Uh, one is about uh, uh, the application of viable rates with drones. If uh, you have uh, any experience uh, about uh, about this, with the drones, uh, the experience that a lot of people would do is the mapping. Um, I know that there can be done also application with drone, but that would depend on a lot of conditions. For example, um, what do you apply, uh, how big is the field. Uh, because, you know, the drones, then they have their own autonomy and then depends what you apply, how much you need to apply and so on. I mean, I saw drones uh, with applicators and then they do a couple of, they, 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 in bigger field, they just apply and then they run out of, you know, battery, for example. Uh, but it's, uh, it's another frontiers. Yes, it's another frontiers uh, that uh, um, I don't have experience because for the type of agriculture I've been working on, it was mostly bigger field, which was not convenient. I think in small order farms, that could be more advantageous because it's easier to, to do. Okay, thank you. And um, so we have another uh, question about, um, so you know that plant biostimulants are um, used to enhance the tolerance to a biotic stress uh, and uh, then uh, for, for this uh, kind of use, it's very important to identify early stage of uh, plant stress for defining the timing of uh, application. Yeah. And uh, so the question is, what type of stress uh, mar markers can we monitor on crops with the remote sensing helping to optimize uh, the, the timing of uh, biostimulant application? Yeah, here I probably go backwards to the to the... Because there are two, in my opinion, two could be quite fast. One is the water, water stress, because with thermal cameras, we can really get as early, earlier than what we can see with human eye. So, and even before, I mean, if we have um, images of bare soil with, with the soil sensor, and then we know what's in the soil, what, what's happening, the spatial variability. Then we take some thermal images. See, for example, here you can see different temperatures from 24 to 60 degrees Celsius here. And you can see the huge variability within the field. And imagine if you can do this early enough or, or frequently enough that as soon as you see changes in temperature, you know where the stress is going to get triggered and you know where to apply. So this would be one, it would be pretty 
easy or readily to be done. The other could be the nitrogen. If we can predict nitrogen well with those uh, sensors, uh, then we can also uh, adjust for that. So that's, in my opinion, the two areas where things can be done quite soon. Yes. OK, very good. Mm -hmm. And um, one last question to, to close uh, this, uh, this webinar. So um, you talked about uh, uh, precision agriculture and uh, you, the use of land biostimulants. And uh, uh, you said that there is a, a lot to do to, to learn, uh, to combine properly these uh, two approaches to agriculture. And uh, so the question is, uh, what is uh, needed uh, in your opinion to develop more research for connecting the, those uh, two areas? To connect the two areas, I think uh, we need uh, scientists from both uh, research areas to get out of the comfort zone and try to collaborate with each other uh, and develop research ideas and then have funders that are willing to accept this uh, challenge. Now, from a public point of view, at least in Europe, this might come soon because if biostimulants are getting regulated by the EU, then potentially there could be more interest. I think also private public public uh, partnership and our industries work with biostimulants. And if we said, OK, we now want to try to make it to understand why sometimes work, sometimes doesn't work, we want to understand that to, how digital technology can help us to leverage and to optimize this application of biostimulants, then maybe there could be other also opportunities there. So I think there are plenty of opportunities, but the first step is getting out of the comfort zone and trying to talk to each other. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your answers. And uh, this was the last question for today. Uh, and uh, would like to thank you again for uh, the nice presentation. And uh, I would like also to thank everybody for attending the webinar. And uh, if you still have uh, questions, please uh, don't hesitate to submit them on biostimulant.com, where we have uh, a specific section called uh, Ask the Expert. So you can submit the questions and uh, our scientific committee will get back uh, to you with the answers. So I would like to remind that uh, the recorded version of this webinar will be available soon on biostimulant.com and on our social media. So uh, stay tuned. And uh, have a nice day, everybody. And I hope uh, to see you on the next uh, webinar. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.